parliamentary experts to discuss what makes a good green government. As Leslie said, um, Caroline has to leave bang on 12.10 to get back for the badger cowl debate, so completely unexpected, nothing she can do about it. And um, other panellists have um, kindly agreed to change the order somewhat so that we can still hear from Caroline before she has to leave. So, um, to my left, I have Conservative peer, Lord John Deben, um, Chair of the Independent Committee on Climate Change. I am also joined by Luciana Berger, Shadow Minister for Climate Change, and of course by Caroline Lucas, Green MP for Brighton Pavilion at the end. We've got an hour here to debate and discuss big challenges for government in seeking to establish a green economic policy. And I really want to hear, to start with, um, from each panelist about the extent to which they think government is meeting that challenge. So I will start by asking Lord John Deben, um, recently appointed to the new role at the Committee on Climate Change from September of this year, but of course with previous ministerial experience under the major government as Secretary of State for Environment, um, to give his views on the extent to which the government is meeting the green economic challenge. John, you're very welcome. Um, great to have you here and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure that I'm going to be very good at doing, answering your question because uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, in the unusual position of being uh, somebody who has sat as a Conservative for many years but who was appointed to this job by a Liberal Democrat uh, 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 minister in, in London, a uh, Labour minister in um, First Minister in Wales, a Scottish nationalist in Scotland, and uh, even more surprising, you may think, a Democratic Unionist Party uh, minister in Northern Ireland. So uh, when I say I'm going to be independent, I think I always have been independent on these issues. I certainly am going to be that, so I'm not going to make a judgment of the government. I'm going to tell you what I think the government ought to be doing, and you can make your own judgment as to whether it's doing it properly. Because for me, we are extremely lucky to have the Climate Change Act, um, I did play some part in that all-party battle. Uh, we should pay great tribute to uh, those stalwart Labour members who said they were not going to be forced into voting against it, and they made it possible for this to be an all-party decision. It was a hugely valuable thing. And it's valuable for one fundamental reason. It does make it possible for governments to have to think beyond five years. And that's why it's absolutely crucial and uh, we are lucky enough also to have led other nations into doing similar things. The latest decision of the uh, both houses of the Mexican parliament shows that this is reaching well beyond the normal groups of people to try to make sure that climate change is treated with the longevity that it has to have. So the first thing that uh, the government uh, uh, has to, any government has to accept is that we have a commitment to reduce our emissions uh, by the year 2050 by 80 percent and you will all remember that was a hard-fought commitment because it started off by being 60 percent and then we had to battle and and uh, Ed Miliband um, uh, was uh, instrumental in ensuring that we got it to the level which was independently decided upon so we have that to do and in order to reach to that we have to have a series of um, uh, of budgets which the government has to keep to uh, the fourth carbon budget being the latest of these. And those budgets can't be changed unless the Climate Change Committee says that the circumstances have so far altered uh, that change is necessary. Uh, and that means that one obviously has a program to, to look at this and to make sure that we uh, can still and should still meet the obligations that we have written down uh, for those uh, budgets. Now, uh, we could of course say that the budget isn't tough enough. Uh, we could say that the budget needs to be changed because it in some areas cannot be reached. But that is for the committee to decide and we will be deciding that over the next year. So the second thing is, uh, unless there is such a decision, we do have a very clear trajectory almost to the end of the 2020s and we have to stick to that. The third thing I think that we have to recognize is that that means that there are no simple short mechanisms uh, to get round that long-term process. So I wanted just to make a few comments about the 
largely uninformed comments about gas. I, I do hope everybody here knows the facts about gas, because if you only read the Daily Mail, you won't. I don't see a lot of Daily Mail readers here, and that, probably are some. And that cheers me enormously. Let me, uh, let me just make the point. First of all, we can use, in the context of reducing our emissions by 80%, we can use all the likely gas that would be available from fracking in the United Kingdom. And we would use it in those areas where we do need uh, some resource of this kind, and that is largely in home heating. But you wouldn't use it, and I don't think you can use it, uh, in uh, terms of electricity generation. Partly because we haven't got enough, even if you take the most generous likelihood. And partly, of course, because that doesn't reduce the uh, emissions in the way which we have to in order to decarbonize. We will only be able to do it if we have tough environmental restrictions, because if we allow fugitive gases to get out, uh, that sort of frack gas is no better than coal, probably worse. So given the right context, that's what we should do. But the people who think there's going to be cheap gas for all have not read the facts, and I finish with this. First of all, the International Energy Authority says that uh, American gas will increase uh, by double in the next 10 years. So the idea that there's a great sort of welter of cheap gas that's just available is just not true. But after all, fracking is only possible because of the high cost of energy. The idea that it's kind of cheap version is, is, is not so. And then the figures for Europe as a whole are absolutely uh, staggering. If you take the figures for the whole of the European Union, including ourselves, then by the year 2030, uh, it is estimated that the kind of demand we might have for gas is something like 800 billion cubic meters. Now, I can't imagine that, so I just want you to think of the figure. Even if you take the most, a, uh, most optimistic view, Europe is not going to be able to produce more than 80 billion, which leaves a gap, uh, uh, anyone can do the maths, which leaves a gap of 720 billion. And where are we going to get that? Well, we're going to get it from the usual suspects. We're going to have to get it from uh, Russia. We're going to have to get it from North Africa. We're going to have to get it from Saudi Arabia. We're going to have to get it from Qatar. Now, anybody who thinks that you want to put the whole of your future in the hands of a system which depends on that seems to me to have learned none of the lessons, uh, nothing to do with environment, none of the political lessons of the last 40 years. So... There is a very clear answer to those who say there is an easy way forward called the dash to gas, and that is that no sensible person thinks that our future energy needs should be in anything other than a proper portfolio of different mechanisms, most of which ought to be uh, entirely renewable, some of which will be nuclear, and only a very small amount should come from sources over which we have no control. Thank you very much indeed, John, for um, an extremely interesting introduction and really setting the scene for us there with um, the debate that I'm sure is still to come. Um, I just want to remind everyone at this point that you can tweet, um, particularly if you want to send a message about that Daily Mail comment, do feel free. Um, TUCG4G is our hashtag that we're using this afternoon. Um, and Thinking with that in mind, there may be comments from our next speaker that you would want to share with the Twitter sphere. Um, Caroline Lucas, um, previous leader of the Green Party, Green MP for Brighton Pavilion, and currently chair of the All Parliamentary Group on Fuel Poverty, as well as a member of Parliament's Environmental Audit Committee, champion for green issues over many years. Very interested to hear, Caroline, what you have to say as to whether this is the greenest government ever. Uh, tempting as it would be to go down that road, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I promised that I wouldn't sit here and attack the government, um, but suffice to say, no. Um, but I wanted to start by uh, really saying what a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's so nice to be among trade union activists again so soon after the um, inspiring march and rally on Saturday. 
and I just want to pay tribute to the role that the trade unions are playing both in challenging austerity in general and absolutely for making a very progressive case for that just transition to jobs in a, in a low carbon economy. We've been asked to set out the challenges uh, facing government really in terms of becoming uh, a government that really does champion green economic policy. And I guess one point is, is, is around the definitions that people are using. And I, I, actually, I, I said I wasn't going to attack government. I'm just going to have a very small attack on George Osborne, only because uh, there was that extraordinary comment that he made that um, we're not going to save the planet by putting our country out of business. And you do have to wonder what planet he's been on for the past few months, because it, the green economy is actually a sector of the economy that is doing incredibly well, that it's worth 122 billion pounds. It represents around 9% of the overall economy. Um, and in terms of, of employment, um, the low carbon goods and services sector employs around 940,000 people a year. Now that's more than the automobile industry and telecommunications put together. Um, and as you all know, the green economy is massively labor intensive. And so to those who would say that talking about anything green and certainly talking about investing in the green economy at a time when we've got economic difficulties, for those who say that that's a distraction, I would absolutely challenge them and say the opposite, that in fact investing in the green economy is the way out of our economic difficulties, not a distraction from it. In terms of, of, of the points I would make, three challenges um, I've got for uh, the government. The first is picking up uh, Lord Devon's point really about the science. Policy needs to be based on the science. Um, Labour rightly claims um, much credit for driving through the world leading climate change act and have stood by the science in doing so. But I would argue that the science has moved on and we need politicians of all parties now to stand by the science again and to change our targets accordingly. There is a huge uh, momentum building around the understanding that two degrees is not the threshold between um, you know, safety and just a bit of danger. A two degree threshold is absolutely the threshold of extremely dangerous climate change. And that's why more and more voices, particularly in the developing world, are saying that we should be having a goal of not exceeding 1.5 degrees. Um, and if we were to do that, then that does mean looking at our carbon budgets again. It does mean including aviation and shipping in those carbon budgets. And it particularly means making sure that in the new energy bill that the government is producing, there's a very strong decarbonisation target on the face of the bill, um, and one ne that needs to be m more ambitious, certainly, than, than anyone's talking about right now. The second uh, challenge, of course, is about a radical transformation of our energy uh, system. Um, I would want to put demand reduction very high up on, that, on the list of priorities because that tends to get overlooked. It tends to be less interesting and exciting than fracking or nuclear or something else. But actually, demand reduction is, is absolutely key. According to DEC's own figures, energy demand could be reduced by 40% uh, by 2030. And the energy bill that, that, that's about to be launched in the, in the Commons in the next few uh, weeks absolutely has to have demand reduction far higher up the agenda. That also means looking at things like the government's Green Deal policies. That needs to properly um, be a, a real tool for people to be able to uh, invest in energy efficiency in their homes, conservation. At the moment, the interest rates are far too high for that to be an attractive prospect. So let's get the Green Investment Bank properly um, supporting uh, the, uh, the, the Green Deal. I certainly agree with what Le Lord Devon has said about a no new dash for gas. We need strong emission performance standards in the, um, in the EMR uh, uh, legislation as well. Um, but let me talk about th things that we won't agree about, and then unfortunately I'll have to leave while everyone kind of attacks me. But I, I would just say that I think nuclear is a distraction. Um, I think nuclear is a distraction because it's enormously expensive, and just this week ministers are facing another warning um, about how much um, subsidy is essentially going to have to go into new nuclear. And also it takes a huge amount of time to get new nuclear up and running. Scientists are telling us that the next five to ten years are going to be crucial in terms of getting our emissions down and avoiding the worst of climate change. Nuclear can't help us with that. It's also, from the point of view of jobs, not nearly as labor intensive in terms of the jobs it creates as other forms of energy. So let's get rid of that. Uh, the third challenge, transforming our financial system. Um, what I mean by that is, let's make this green investment bank uh, green and a bank. I know that sounds a bit radical, but at the moment the Green Investment Bank isn't necessarily uh, terribly green. It wasn't tied to climate change objectives, which um, Labour and, and Greens were supporting last week in Parliament as, as an amendment to the uh, 
uh, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill. We didn't get that through. Um, and also, it's still not a bank because it's not going to be able to borrow until around 2017. We need that bank to be able to start acting as soon as possible. So let's get that up and running. Secondly, we need to address what's known as the carbon bubble, limiting global warming. Um, to whether it's two degrees or even more so if it was um, 1.5 degrees, means that we can only burn around 20% of the known existing fossil fuels. What that means is that there are huge reserves of coal and oil and gas that are held by companies listed in the city of London, um, but, but their value is based on uh, investments in those fossil fuels, which we can have no hope of actually bringing to market if we're serious about meeting our climate change targets. In a sense, they are subprime assets, just as much as those risky mortgages were that brought the first financial crash. So we need to address that. And finally, and believe me, this is the fastest I've ever spoken, so I do apologize, <laughs> but I've got to go and talk about badges. Um, this is a really important point, and I'm now going to put it in 30 seconds, but we also need to stop measuring economic prosperity in terms of GDP growth alone. We need to get away from that if we're going to be serious about a seriously green economic policy. We need to look at other alternative indicators and recognize that in many ways GDP doesn't guarantee jobs. We need to stop equating the two. There are other ways of having economic activity, sustainable ec economic activity that is about jobs but isn't about forever chasing GDP growth and therefore going along the lines of Beecroft proposals and everything else that comes with it. I do apologize for having to go. I apologize particularly to Luciana because it's exceedingly rude for me to jump ahead of her in the queue and then to leave before she starts. But thank you very much. And I'll look at what you say on Twitter. I'll tweet back to you. Well, um, thanks very much indeed, Caroline. And, um, and thanks for coming to be with us despite the, um, the needs of the Badgers who I'm sure you will be going off to defend with them. Um, with, with great strength. Um, well, last, but by absolutely no means least, I would now, now like to introduce Luciana Berger, Labour MP for Liverpool Waiver Tree since May 2010, and since 2010, in October of the same year, 2010, Shadow Minister for Climate Change, holding the government to account against its pledge to be the greenest government ever. And so I'm sure we're all very interested to hear what our opposition have to say about the government's green policies to date. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction and um, I'm delighted to be on the panel today with Lord Debbin and, and Caroline who sadly had to leave us. I'm sure we would have had an interesting conversation with Caroline. Um, I'm sure we'll continue to have a fascinating discussion and um, it's also nice to see so many friendly faces in the audience. Um, I will try and be as concise as I can. Uh, the other speakers have picked up on some of the points that I wanted to make um, but uh, from a, a, an approach point of view and I think we'll get into the detail in the, con uh, the conversation. I think there are three things that are needed to make a good green government. I think first what's absolutely crucial is that there needs to be a settled view across the whole of government that going green is part of the solution and not the problem. I think every, pro every government has problems getting things done when ministers don't agree. We've seen from the coalition how harder it is, or even harder it is, when two parties don't agree. And since the general election, I think it's regrettable that we've seen a number of departments, particularly Treasury and Biz, uh, fighting against any kind of green policy. Uh, and we've also seen uh, not a lot of action, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit further. I don't think it's enough for the Prime Minister to say as clearly and loudly as he has that he wanted to lead the greenest government ever. This really needs to be backed up by action. And in the last two and a half years, We've seen the consequences of what happens when you don't deliver. We've seen industry losing its confidence. We've seen investment falling in the low carbon sector. And we've seen ourselves overtaken by other countries. And if we look at the Pew report that does an annual assessment of government's investment or a, a, a country's investment in clean tech and renewables, we've slipped from third in the world in 2010 down to 13th. And we've gone slightly up, but we're still at the moment only on eighth, while countries like India and Brazil are storming ahead. Um, 
Caroline touched on it, but there's a really fitting advert. If you find yourselves in Westminster Tube Station, uh, just by the entrance to Parliament, it went up in the last couple of days, supported by many uh, groups working in the low carbon sector and, and charities and green groups, reminding the Chancellor that our growth in this country, a third of our growth, is due to growth in the low carbon sector. And actually, without it, we would be in a much worse place than we are. So I think a strong commitment to the green agenda across the whole of government is absolutely vital to getting things done. And once you have that consensus, the second thing is to have a policy-making process which puts low carbon at its heart and not as an added extra. And we see far too many government documents published uh, and it's, you have to flick right to the back to see the low carbon page. Uh, it, usually it says very little and it promises even less. And the whole thing leaves you feeling like someone put it in because they felt they had to, rather than because they wanted to. And we truly believe that good green governments incorporate low carbon into their core economic offering, not just as an added extra or something that's just left to the deck department or to the environment department. And that's what we did. Um, uh, in what Labour did in government. We saw biz working with the Treasury and DEC and DEFRA. We had the 2009 low carbon industrial strategy, which focused the whole government on delivering green growth. Uh, and it's, approach, it's an approach that we've continued in opposition with our low carbon jobs and growth policy review, which brings together shadow ministers and the shadow teams from biz, from Treasury, from DEC, um, and right across the policy uh, sphere. And finally, it's important to put in place long-term commitments. Both the other speakers have referred to our long-term commitments. It's absolutely crucial so that industry has the certainty and confidence to invest and that successive ministers and hopefully successive governments can focus on delivery rather than on policy principles. Uh, it was the last Labour government that introduced the Climate Change Act. It was the world's first long-term legally binding framework to reduce our carbon emissions, which all the main parties uh, supported at the time. But it's, this, is, this has been absolutely crucial in giving industry the certainty that they need. And I hear this time and time and time again in different fora. Um, and however much some people would like to turn the clock back on the debate, you know, they want to discuss whether climate change exists or, or whether we need to tackle it, the climate check is there in place and forces governments to act. I should caveat this by saying that the long-term commitments can only work if all parties continue to support them. I do fear that we are beginning to see our carbon targets uh, being bent slightly, uh, featured on the front page of a newspaper just the other week. And I think it will be in the upcoming energy bill, which we've seen the draft of, but we understand there are number of, uh, a number of drafts and amends going on at the moment where we'll see whether the government is really serious about meeting them. So in conclusion, a good green government needs a whole government approach. It needs consensus. It needs to put low carbon growth at the heart of policy development and delivery. And it needs long term commitments, which ensure certainty uh, and which there can no be no deviation from. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm back on now. Thanks very much indeed for, um, for that broad overview of the opposition policies. Yeah, we can do a round of applause now as well if you want. That's fine. <laughs> um, and now it is over to you. We've heard a huge amount already, it seems to me. We've discussed our energy mix. We've discussed our markets for low-carbon goods and services. We've discussed the Green Investment Bank. We've discussed the need for cross-government policymaking. And we've discussed our climate change commitments. So huge um, breadth of policy areas to cover. I know we have an enormous expertise in the room as well as on the panel. Um, and I am happy to announce that our panel is now fully online, so also able to actively engage with you on Twitter if you want to try those hashtags out. Um, I'm going to go for a quick round of questions to start with. There's a gentleman right over there on the left who's had his hand up first, and um, someone else also in the left-hand corner. And then um, this woman over here in purple, please, next, just so that we um, have a balance from both sides of the room. <laughs> woman in purple. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello. Very uh, nice purple top. <laughs> David Powell from Friends of the Earth. A question in two parts. Uh, Lord Devon, so George Osborne has said that, quote, gas is cheap. Uh, so where's he getting his facts from? Has he not read the facts? Um, or whose facts is he listening to? And, and Luciana, 
what does Labour need to do to be the greenest opposition ever? Are we hearing enough from Labour um, in response to the things that the government are doing? Um, and, and what can we expect to see being done differently over the next few years uh, in response to the government? Thanks very much. I think there was a gentleman um, over there. Have you got a microphone? Is someone over there had their hand up. No, do you still have a question to ask at the back? No? Yes, yes, no. There was a gentleman previously had his hand up over there. No? Okay, we'll move straight over to over here then. Thanks very much. Laura Cohen, British Ceramic Confederation, a trade association for ceramic manufacturers in the UK. Is the government, or is the UK, measuring the right thing to be truly green? Because many people would argue that we should first of all be looking at con carbon consumed in the UK rather than just made here. And secondly, there's a real danger that we're moving to a throwaway society. We surely should be, I know it's challenging to do, but we should be looking at life cycle carbon emissions, cradle to grave, looking at end of life emissions too, to ensure that we're really getting sensible consumer durable solutions that are sustainable. Thanks very much. Well, I'll just take those two for the moment. Um, Lord Deven, would you like to kick off? Well, I, I just want to say something about government, all governments, because I do think we just have to fake... I hope we're going to be very adult about this, and I'm in a position to be able to do so simply, A, because of age, and B, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm rather relishing this, this new ability to, be to try to be as uh, independent as I can be. The fact is, the truth about the car... I went through the getting, the, the getting the Climate Change Act through. The truth was, the Treasury and the government of the time was totally opposed to it. It did everything in its power to stop it. Parliament passed that Act. Not the Labour Party, not the Conservative Party, not the Friends of the Earth who wrote it, but it was Parliament. And it was because Labour members of Parliament told their government, we are not going to vote the way you want me to vote. And the Prime Minister of the time was furious. And indeed, his representative walked in to deck, threw down the act on the table and said, there you are, you've got your bloody bill. There was no... Why was that? Because the Treasury is always opposed to this. This has nothing to do with government. The Treasury does not want its hands tied ever. So the only point I want to make is, being... A green government in any circumstance will always end up, did in the last government, is in this government, will do it in the next government, whatever it is, will always end up with the tension between the Treasury's deep feeling that it should not tie its own actions, that it should be wholly in charge, and it does that on everything. It's not just, I mean, Luciana, you'll find very much, it's in every single aspect of government. That is what the Treasury is brought up to think. And it does it wherever the circumstances take place. And they kind of convince ministers, as they convinced uh, uh, Mr. Brown, as they convinced uh, Pre the only minister I can think of, because I sat with him when he did it, when, he f when Ken Clark said to the Treasury Mandarin of the greatest kind, I'm very sorry, we're going to have the uh, uh, landfill tax, whether you like it or not. And it is going to be hypothecated whether you like it or not. Well, it doesn't often happen that way. So I just want to say all governments are going to have that tension, and it is a good tension at its best and an appalling tension at its worst. So... Uh, I'm quite sure that the Chancellor will have been told by the Treasury, as, it, uh, as all Chancellors are, um, that uh, you've got to keep your options open. Um, the Treasury doesn't believe that you should uh, put any weight on the future. You should just uh, do what is, seems to be the best thing now. We don't want to, we don't want to pick winners. We, we've no idea what's going to happen. I'm sure that's the kind of pressure. So there's a huge need for all the rest of us to say, I'm very sorry... That doesn't mean you make random decisions. Of course we don't know what's going to happen. Of course we've no idea what the real price of gas is going to be in 2030. If we did, everyone here would be a millionaire because it would be a wonderful thing to do. We don't know. 
So what do you do? You don't take random decisions. You take the best decisions that you can, given the information that you've got. So my, this is why I go on trying to use the figures, why I keep on making those points. And the, the opposition, and it was true of us in opposition, and it's true of Labour Party opposition, it has the great strength of being able to talk the pure uh, story without having the Treasury uh, making the sort of pressures that Treasuries have to make, but on this occasion, I think, uh, make it to a degree which is probably uh, greater than is necessary. Now, um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to be independent. So, um, <laughs> uh, now, now, I want to take... Uh, I'm, I'm awfully sorry that you've, you've named this lady, who now I shall remember forever <laughs> in the colour of her coat. But, look, um, we've tried in the Climate Change Committee to see what you would do if you had... Um, carbon consumed as a, a mechanism. There are, I mean, I'm instinctively in favour of what you're saying, so I'm not opposed to it, but, but there are huge um, statistical problems of doing that. Um, first of all, there is no internationally agreed basis, so comparisons are extremely difficult. Secondly, how do you deal with the carbon that you use and then export um, there are a whole series of issues of this kind. I just say to you, we have come to the conclusion that it produces so uncertain an answer that uh, it, it is not the way to proceed. So that's why we stick to the measure that we have. Um, but it's a measure that we have to remember has huge drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks is, of course, that you can export uh, emissions um, and then, uh, uh, but you do, count the, you do count the emissions of the import bit, but you have exported emissions, so you've got a, you've got a real problem here. I absolutely agree, but I think it's better to recognise that all the time while having a comparator which actually works when comparing yourself with other people and comparing yourself with the past. I think it's safer to do that. And the other thing about a throwaway society, of course you're right. Um, we have... I'm old enough to have gone through the stage in which we saved everything, because if you didn't save it, you didn't have it. That's what happened during the war and afterwards. Then through the period in which you threw things away because that was supposed to create jobs. Do you remember? You know, the thing that was mattered was you threw it away because then you could have another one. Uh, and we're now in a situation in which we've just got to realise that the real problem for the world is that we are resource constrained. You don't need to believe in climate change. Nine billion people on this earth mean you have to do all these things anyway. And so you're right. Thanks very much. And um, Luciana, a, a number of points there to come back on um, around about um, what Labour can do to be the greenest opposition ever. And, and also some comments there you might want to respond to from Lord Leaven about the operation of the Treasury under the last Labour government. Uh, well, I, I, listened, I listened with notes to Lord Devon's comments. Um, but I think at the end of the day, actions actually speak louder than words, and there might have been disagreement, but we did still pass that legally binding Climate Change Act, which was the first in the world, and it did require lots of people to come together, but we did it. Um, I've had conversations with Gordon Brown. I think his commitment to the, to the environment and the planet is, is, is there, but I, I can see you shaking your head. Um, if I can come... Can I just say, isn't it exciting, isn't it exciting that Parliament did it? I mean, I think we ought to say, I'm not prepared to take credit for the Conservative Party, although if I wanted to, I could say we started... I don't want that. I think Parliament, our Parliament, actually said to people, bother off. <laughs> That's what I love about it. I'm sorry, but... It's all right. Um, if I can come back to David Powell's um, question, it was a, there was an op-ed on, on the eve of Labour Party conference, I believe, uh, on that very question, and I think um, the author of that uh, piece would have been happy to hear the speeches made by a number of uh, different shadow secretaries of state ar around Labour's position. You make the point about what we can do in opposition. It is a challenge. Um, I, I, I can share with you the challenge of trying to raise the issues and put them on the agenda. We have a government that uh, increasingly seems disinterested. We have a, a media which is increasingly disinterested. The challenge to get any stories in the national press on this agenda are so incredibly difficult. You know, there was a time when The Guardian would print nine stories a day. Now you struggle to get one, and that's just in The Guardian. And we're contending with the Daily Mail press and similar outlets that you know, are keen to propagate you know, the myths and, and we're challenging it on all different fronts. 
Um, and it's not helped by having over 100 Tory backbenchers. And I have to make the political point, but th you know, that's part of the challenge where you've got over 100 Tory backbenchers that are you know, releasing letters to the press against various forms of renewable energy. So the challenge is there, but we are trying as the opposition to be responsible, to be leading the way on this debate. Um, despite the fact that the government have removed the national indicator um, framework where you know councils now don't have to report on their emissions we are working with councils of any color but particularly labor councils that are trying in spite of that to lead the way locally on this agenda you know it was labor um, that have tried in the last energy bill to look at things like introducing local carbon budgets which we you know we've had discussions and we've seen the climate change committee respond to so we are trying that the issue is uh, broadly is about trying to get our message out and so we're trying to use alternative platforms using our own websites to, to do that in spite of the fact that we are not afforded the platform that we would like in the national press. Um, if I can come back to, to Laura's question, um, there is a massive issue, and we talk a lot about carbon leakage, um, and that's a term and a phrase that is difficult to explain and, and articulate, and um, you mentioned, Laura, that you're um, from the ceramic industry, which is an energy-intensive sector, and we're also trying to reconcile uh, in Parliament and in the discussions that we have how we can ensure that we keep our energy-intensive uh, industries um, in the UK because a lot of them are looking to, to leave and that in turn will see you know carbon being imported back into this country so it is a discussion that we're having um, Caroline mentioned about demand reduction which is a whole another element of the discussion and debate which hasn't um, had the time that it deserves um, Lord Devon oh no forgive me I can't remember who it was that said about um, um, about the about the forthcoming energy bill but there is in fact it was Caroline um, there is nothing actually in the bill as it stands in its draft form that which talks about demand reduction and actually if we're serious about reducing our emissions um, you know this is something that we need to be looking at it's not actually how we look at our supply and how we create energy but how we reduce our demand in the first place and that feeds into the wider debate about recycling and how we can use platforms locally around things like free cycle and just trying to do a lot more around education of the wider public Thanks very much indeed. Um, more questions, please, from people in the audience. Okay, there's a gentleman at the front here with um, a blue tie, just to keep my um, clothing <laughs> identification system going. Um, a gentleman over there in um, the top left, and um, this gentleman right at the front here, and then I promise I'll come to that side of the room next round, okay? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Mike Clancy, General Secretary, designate of the Union Prospect, and the tie colour doesn't indicate uh, political preference, uh, particularly. Um, uh, uh, last week we had energy policy um, developed at the dispatch box, and we also had energy policy somewhat responded to from uh, the other side of the floor of the House of Commons. Um, whatever our objectives are in relation to um, green growth, uh, balanced energy policy, and so on, um, how uh, are either of the main political parties going to resolve the conundrum that challenging the behaviours of the major companies, the so-called big six, in the retail market poses other challenges if you are minded to break them up in relation to who's going to build the uh, plants, the assets, uh, make the investment in a balanced and green energy policy? Thanks very much, Mike. Um, it was the gentleman over there with the um, blue shirt. Thanks very much. Uh, Gary Willis from Public and Commercial Services Union. I mean, trade unions can be, well, they are an amazing asset to work with employers in the workplace on energy efficiency measures and many other initiatives. And what would make a green government from, from our perspective would be if governments um, don't attack our facility time, uh, and if they gave proper recognition um, to, to green reps as a representative on the same basis as health and safety reps or, or any other. I was speaking to a, rep, to a PCS rep here um, who has had to attend, uh, who, who can't tell his employer what, what he's actually doing today because it wouldn't be accepted as a legitimate, um, a legitimate activity for the kind of rep that he, that he is. You know, whereas we'd like to be able to attend as green reps and, and, work with, and work with employers in their workplaces, whether it's the government as an employer or, or in other sectors of, of the workforce, and actually contribute to the, towards the greening of the economy. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. And it was this gentleman just in the front row here. There's a microphone just on its way behind you. Hi, my name's uh, Saeed Ahmed from a research group called Energy for London. Uh, just to shift the focus a little bit, um, this uh, panel is about what makes a good green government. I'd just like to ask what makes a green local government. Uh, Luciana touched upon some of the things that Labour did in terms of uh, uh, their dialogue around carbon reduction in local government. And Lord Eben, just before you took on your role, um, the CCC came out with a extremely good report talking about uh, the cuts that could be made in carbon emissions, the ways in which local government could be much more energy efficient in around about May this year. Soon after, DEC published their own guidance, um, a revision of the Home Energy Conservation Act, which unusually for a government guidance document had the word might in it 19 times. So it provided very little you know, stick in terms of uh, local government achieving those carbon emission savings. And one of the things that David Kennedy, the Climate Change Committee, said he was pleasantly surprised, if that's the right phrase, that local government play an incredibly important part in actually saving carbon emissions, and government needs to recognize that and actually do something about it. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'll come to um, Luciana first there. A range of questions around about secure and green investment, the role of green reps in the workplace, and what role government, um, local government has to play in um, reducing emissions. Excellent. If I can come to Gary's question first. Um, I've seen firsthand the great role that, and great job that green reps can play in the workplace. Um, I heard a, um, a story of a, a high street retailer who was non-unionized and that offered their employees free energy insulation. Um, and just a fraction of those employees took that up, which was a massive, massive shame. They had over 100,000 employees and less than 500 took up this free energy installation. And I wonder if green reps had been in that workplace, if that figure would have been a bit higher. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge and um, anything that I can do to support green reps in the, in the workplace, I'm happy to do. We also see it in some schools where we have green schools and actually it's, it's school green reps that are actually helping to educate their parents and grandparents about the need to do things like recycle and, and look after our planet too. Um, Saeed, what makes a uh, green local government? Um, I touched on just before about our proposal that we'd like to see local carbon budgets because actually while we've got these fantastic national targets without actually something driving behaviour at local level and something to uh, make local authorities deliver on, on a, a low carbon agenda, it's, it's unlikely that it will be as fast or as quick or as... as, as um, focus as we'd like it to be. That's why the Climate Change Committee responded with a report on that front. Um, there are lots of councils, it's really important to say, right across the country of all colours that are doing a really good job and are focusing on this agenda and see the benefits not only for the local economy, for the planet, for fuel poverty, which is um, something that you know, really needs to be focused on. Um, that's why we're working with those that are doing that to share best practice with other local authorities that aren't doing it. I think it's a travesty that the government has re removed that national indicator because it, it, it did make local authorities really focus on the work that they were doing. Um, and you know, I'd like to see that come back as, as soon as possible. But at the very least, a local carbon plan would ensure that local authorities are working with businesses and local uh, voluntary sector groups uh, and transport organisations collectively to really focus locally on what can be done. And, and I think that's really crucial, and I hope that that can happen as soon as possible to replicate what is already happening in, in some places across the country. Um, Mike, your question about, about our energy market. Our energy market is broken. Um, we have a situation now where we've got six companies that dominate 99% of the market and there is very little transparency, if at all. We saw Ofgem come up last week um, with their response to the retail, mar to the retail market review. Um, lots of those changes won't be in train until the middle next of next year, if at all. But that's just tinkering around at the edges. And what we've said is, is a number of things that have to happen, particularly um, in light of the fact that we've all seen our energy bills go up by over £200 in, in the last two years. The average household is now spending £1,310 a year on, on its dual fuel bill. We need to see the dominance broken up. We've said that we think that all energy companies should have to pull their energy so onto the open market, the long-term market, not the spot market, but the long-term market, so that everyone has equal access. That will... Uh, it, um, bring in new entrants to the market and we'll add some transparency because at the moment we don't know how much it's costing those big six to, to generate the energy and, and how much it's and essentially sending it to themselves and what that, those costs are. 
um, we don't know. We do know, for instance, that British Gas have reported that um, they've seen a 23% increase in profits on their retail sector at a time when they're putting prices up by 10%. And is that right? Um, you know, in terms of how much is needed to ensure the, the investment, and, and it is a lot of investment, there's different figures, but it's you know, 100, around £120 billion of investment that we do need in order to ensure our security of supply. And that's, that's, you know, that, that figure can't be in, ignored, but we equally need to see transparency in the market so we know exactly um, you know, how much it's costing energy companies. There was a report out um, not so long ago which questioned the efficiency of the big six companies, that they've made very little efficiency sa um, savings in, in the job that they've done um, uh, and how that has or hasn't been passed on, on to the consumer. So I think you know, it's absolutely crucial that we get that transparency in order to have the discussion about how much is or isn't available for investment and how much government then needs to put in. Thanks very much, Luciana. We've got about um, 25 minutes left, so if there's anything there that you want to come back on briefly, Lord Deben, and then we'll go on to another round of questions. Well, let me ju just take the local, local government uh, issue, which I think is absolutely crucial. Um, whatever the institutional techniques, and I'm trying not to go in for mission creep, but that's one of the problems I was, <laughs> have very strong views about what we could do as far as local government's concerned, but I do think local government plays a huge part. And uh, what Luciana says is absolutely right. It's, gov it's local governments of, of all political parties are both good and bad. So if I'm making a list of the best ones, they would contain all three political parties. If I'm making a list of the worst ones, they'd also contain that. So it's, it's, uh, and one of the interesting things, it tends to be that somebody on the local authority uh, is very keen. And, and there's a huge need for encouraging those personalities who will drive it and drive it and drive it. I, just seen the change in Suffolk, for example, when new leader who takes this very seriously, I mean, within a terribly short time, the whole attitude has changed utterly. And, and it happens the other way around, too, when, when somebody leaves and, and, and takes. So I, I think local government has a huge part to play because, in the end, I get very bored with having the arguments about the principle. I'm terribly keen on getting the practices happening. And you can take a... I talked to a council the other day. It owns 2,000 buildings in its uh, area, and it doesn't need a very large number of those. Uh, it's got to rationalise, it's got to make the buildings that it does use much more efficient. And then I said to it, but you've also got to make the buildings you sell more efficient, because your role is to make sure you pass on a building which is better and saves uh, energy. So, yes, local government, crucial part to play. We need to encourage it, and we need to encourage it right across the board. Just one comment about... Um, the, uh, en uh, the energy industry. There's one little known fact which I think we've really got to emphasise, and that is that although, of course, they haven't done enough, the um, efficiencies in the way in which energy is delivered and produced uh, make up for a very high proportion of the efficiencies in British manufacturing industry, which is an important part of our economy, much more important than many make it out to be. Uh, I don't think we've yet had anything like the efficiencies to uh, complement that from manufacturing industry. And one of the things we've got to do is to find better structures to help manufacturing industry when they've got long-term decisions to make to be able to improve uh, their, their, uh, their efficiency, which is still, not up to, uh, still nothing like up to the line it ought to be. Thanks very much there. Okay, um, there was a couple of gentlemen um, in the back there, yep, who had, um, had their hands up and um, a, the woman with um, the purple wristband at the back of the hall there. Yeah, okay, uh, Mike, Roberts, or, uh, Mike Roberts, LGA Labour Group speaking personally, so that gives Lucinda a view of, uh, yes, I'm in the red corner, but I'm also in the green corner by being a Friends of the Earth member and Greenpeace member as well. Um, two questions. Um, somebody who comes from local government, one of the great frustrations that local government has and as continues to have is the fact that uh, whether whichever government is in, and I say this quite bluntly, um, we don't get the resources and we don't get the focus in relationship to the support mechanisms that we need. And this is particularly true at the moment. Um, so what measures would you expect from CLG that what openness, what transparency, what direction of travel should CLG be pushing forward to support local government? And how do we get the Treasury thinking 
less of Milton Friedman and more of Paul Krugman. Um, and the other one which goes along, I'm, I'm off, unfortunately, a bit like Caroline, to talk to a senior stakeholder meeting down at uh, Winchester this afternoon uh, with all the key business leaders there, is about regional policy and planning. It is a complete shambles and disaster area at this point in time. We cannot deliver green environment policies if we don't have the means and mechanisms to do it. So how are we going to respond to that massive gap? Okay, thank you. Um, and the other gentleman just there with the um, red and black shirt on, I think, Jack. Um, my name is Colin Hines from the Green New Deal Group. Um, I think the most important answer to what makes a good green government is to get rid of the one that we've got at present. Because over the last two years, it's become very clear that their interest is, is privatization and deregulation. They will never be a green government. And so what is amazing to me is that the trade union movement, the Labour Party, the non-liberal de de Liberal Democrats aren't plotting to have an election next year. Because if you let them stay for another two years, more than two years, they are going to devastate things. Now, if you get on to the question, that yeah, would be great. Yeah, so, well, that's the first question. Why yeah. isn't there discussion about having an election earlier? But the second question is that the local authorities that we mentioned are absolutely crucial. And um, Lord Devon made a key point about practicalities on the ground. And Birmingham, for example, is introducing 100 million pounds um, for 60,000 houses over the next 10 years, wants to link up with 20 other local authorities to a 1.5 billion program. This is huge with private money and private people involved as well. Southampton wants to link together with 10 others to go for a bond issue. So the local authorities have a key way forward. And I think, final point, having been on the march on Saturday, I think it's quite good to join two things together. Can't cut, won't cut from the local authorities, but can employ, will employ. And places like Birmingham are showing that the green economy does mean local jobs and local authorities have an absolutely central role. So I hope the Labour government will, next government, if it comes in, will take that in account. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much there. And um, there was a woman at the back going to here with a question as well. Uh, Linda Clark, University of Westminster and UCU member. I'm, I'm slightly shocked by this discussion because um, I think there's only one investment and that's in people. And um, we have 25% youth unemployment, 50% black youth unemployment, incredible austerity measures and people being put onto, made redundant. We, the only way we're going to get a green economy is to have a proper training system. There's, there's no training in this country for concreters, groundworks, all these things you're talking about that aren't the people to do it and they're not being trained and the young people have no perspective being given to them. We, we have, if you have solar installation, photovoltaic installation, heat pump installation, they are highly sensitive to highly skilled, to, they need incredible skills and education. It's not going to be solved any of this with one or two weeks training. We need okay. to revamp the entire training system and I haven't heard a word about it. Thanks very much. I think, um, I think in fairness to our panel, we are covering the entirety of government policy on green economic <laughs> issues in about an hour, but I'm sure people will want to come back and talk specifically about skills policy. Um, I'll go to Lord Deben first. Various issues there around about local government, regional policy, job creation potential, and also skills. Well, I entirely agree about the comment about skills. I always remember being appalled uh, presenting as, well, as a minister the uh, uh, prize for the first person who'd gone through uh, a new construction industry um, course and I had the TUC representative there and it was appalling to think that there hadn't been such a course before that, that, there, that, that, that the, the amount of training that we have had and the way it's been done has been appalling. There was a very good debate in the House of Lords on the subject of higher education and, and again, a very important factor that we have, it's the, it's the Cinderella of the education system and it's hugely important and I just want to say I don't think I could be I mean the lady's very tough about this I'm just as tough about it training is absolutely crucial 
I want to have a go at the gentleman over there, and I'll tell you why I want to have a go. The green issues that we're faced with are far too important constantly to say, well, if we had a Tory government or if we had a Labour government, then it'd all be all right. Frankly, the problem is that all governments disappoint those of us who recognise that the central issue is how we start living our lives differently in order to achieve a world which doesn't destroy itself. And I'm fed up with Tories saying that you have to have a Tory government to do it, and Liberal Democrats saying it, and Labour. The truth is, the last Labour government failed to do the job. This government will fail to do the job. It always is true. And our job is to get together all those who understand it, instead of constantly trying to pretend that the party political system provides the answer to what has to be a universal a change in the way in which we think about this thing. Now, different parties will have different ways of delivering it, but the moment you suggest that a particular way, which happens to be yours, is the only way to do it, we're not going to win this battle. We've actually got to put those issues aside and fight the battle. So what this government does that's good, we should be praising it and not making that kind of comment. And what this government does is bad, Tories should be opposing it. And that's the fact of a, of a world in which we've really got to work together. I feel very strongly about it. I'm very pleased to be in a position to be absolutely even-handedly about, about it. But if we don't do that, we'll be letting everybody down because of our shibboleths of party politics of right or left. The second thing I want to say about that whole argument is this. Um, people react better for encouragement than they do for uh, attacks. And I want to encourage people. I want to encourage Luciana Berger for many of the things that she's saying which ought to be said and need to be said by an opposition. I want to encourage the things that uh, Greg Barker are doing, the things that we've heard from Greg Clark, the things that we're uh, seriously having from a whole range of ministers. I want to encourage them as well as attacking those who aren't delivering. One of the things we've got to learn in the Green Movement is the word thank you, because that gets more things done. And we need to do both of those, and we need to do it right across the board, and it needs to be respectable to be green at every point of the political spectrum, except, of course, on the far left and the far right, who are wrong, and they always will be, and therefore there is a movement between those two. Now, I want one last thing, which is this. There is a real issue which I think none of us have actually got right, and I don't know what the answer is. It's this. Um, yes, you can have planning systems which tell people how they shall run their area and their region and the rest of it, and you can enforce it. And that sounds as if you're doing it better. I just have come through a whole period of time in which you could get nobody to cooperate with anybody on planning because of the regional planning structure and the fact that everybody in Suffolk hated it, thought they didn't understand it, and were booming well not going to support it. You've got to find a way in planning of actually getting people to, to own the decisions that are made. So I say to the gentleman about planning, the trouble is that planning is about people and people making decisions about their own future. And if you try to do that on a regional basis which nobody feels associated with, then you won't get the answer. We've got to find a way of democratising planning in the sense of making it possible for people to believe that they are part of the system. Not sure this government's got it right. The last government didn't get it right. I think it's the most difficult question. We've got to find an answer. Thanks very much indeed. And Luciana, your views on that broad range of subject. If I can start with Linda's point, very important point about skills, it is absolutely crucial, and I'm only sorry that I didn't get to mention it in, in my opening remarks. Um, I referred to the policy work that we're doing, uh, looking at how do we create a, a low-carbon industrial strategy for green growth, and one of the points, one of the five pillars in that is around training, is around training and how we can have a strategy for skills for a low-carbon economy. So we're looking at that very directly, and we've got experts involved in the formulation of that policy. You may have heard also that we've um, announced that we're going to introduce a technical baccalaureate, a gold standard technical baccalaureate, and I'm sure that that will equally focus on the low-carbon sector. 
Um, there are people being trained, and I've seen them myself at Liverpool Community College, just outside my constituency, where people are learning how to install solar PV, how they're learning to put in green technologies. The challenge is about what opportunities there are after they've learnt those skills to actually to have those jobs. And um, you know, I, I'm sorry to make party political points, but the fiasco that we saw with the reduction in the feed-in tariffs has essentially decimated those opportunities for people working in that sector. I know many businesses that saw their businesses shrink overnight and those apprenticeships that were previously available, they had to all you know, essentially finish. Um, and likewise, we, you know, we've got a big concern about, we've just seen the government introduce the Green Deal. Um, and as um, the Green Deal is a national programme for energy efficiency, which is absolutely crucial for our country, we do have some of the most energy inefficient properties in Europe. But the challenge is how the government have created this scheme is that we're about to see an absolute decimation of our insulation sector. Um, we have uh, millions of homes that still need cavity and loft insulation, but the government's shifting the focus very suddenly to solid wall insulation. And while solid wall insulation uh, does provide um, jobs, it's, it's highly skilled, we've equally got people with the skills in the insulation sector. And just looking at the figures, we're, gonna, we're expecting to see, we've seen 900,000 homes um, have their cavity and lofts insulated this year. That's set to drop to 150,000 next year. It's an 83% reduction. And, and what that's going to do for people working in that sector and, and for young people, you know, I, I've got a number of concerns and we've raised those in Parliament too. So I, I, I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but it is absolutely crucial. We are focusing on it as the opposition, but I, I worry about what the impact will be for jobs in certain elements of the low carbon uh, domain. Um, Colin, your question about, um, many questions, but your uh, question about um, an election. First of all, the, the coalition's introduced fixed term parliaments. So um, unless there's a vote of no confidence, we won't be having an election, sadly, until 2015. Um, but your point about fantastic councils like Birmingham, I've been to Birmingham and seen firsthand the work that they are doing. It is really, really positive. And, um, you know, there was a change in administration and, and you know, councils of both colour now have, have done that work and are continuing to do that work and lead the way. They've benefited from some of the £200 million pound pot of um, support that the government's made available for Green Deal Go Early schemes, so, so that, that they're able to benefit from that. But the challenge is, um, is that there are many councils, and I look at my own council locally, Liverpool Council, where there's a reticence and a fear about borrowing. A, because they might not have the reserves um, to borrow against, and B, because they don't know what's coming down the line. And you know, the challenge around, you know, if I look locally, we, you know, a council having to make £90 million of in-year cuts you know, with a month's notice, £50 million the year after, asking that local authority to you know, invest you know, millions as Birmingham have done, I can, I can understand their fear and their reticence. Of course, they should be bold. Um, it links to, the, to Mike's question about local authorities, you know, about resources. And you know, unless those resources are made available then the, and, and the government makes um, councils focus on this work, they're probably less inclined to do so because they've got immediate priorities to focus on and we don't know what's going to happen with the forthcoming changes to council tax and what that, you know, the impact that that's going to have on local authority budgets. I'm just doing a piece of work, a massive FOI piece of work, looking at right across the country the reduction in the number of um, officers within councils that are looking specifically at this kind of work. Um, I don't have a complete picture yet, but it's, uh, it's fair to say that the almost complete picture that I've got is not a pretty one. Um, and you know, that's reflective of a reduction in, in support available to local authorities. And we just need to make the case that without you know, councils really leading the way, we're not going to see change on the ground. Um, I'm just checking that I've answered all the different points. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm just, we've got five minutes left um, here in the hall. So what I'm going to do is take two more questions. Um, this woman in the purple cardigan at the front and this gentleman in the blue suit behind her. And then I'm going to ask each panelist just to briefly respond and to give their closing views on the entire debate before we wind up for lunch. Clara Pella from PCS Union. I mean, I do not feel comfortable to sit in a room in a TUC conference where people are having a laugh with you know, Mr. Deben. And I don't think, Luciana, you should apologize to make any political point because all of that is very political. At a time where your government, Mr. Deben, is cutting benefit to disabled people, destroying the NHS, privatizing public services and school, I can tell you that we do not believe that your government are going to do anything about tackling climate change and invest public money in the right place. 
This government is not doing anything good. So my question is for Luciana. Under labor, what place will it be for direct government investment in job creation, in publicly owned energy production sector, publicly owned transport system, and a publicly owned housing provision? Okay, thank you. And um, gentleman behind. Hello, Paul Toyne. I, I work for a global design, engineering, environmental company called WSP. I'm also a commissioner on behalf of the Mayor of London on sustainable development. I have a very quick observation. One is, I don't think it's a good idea just to be judging governments around its greenness just on carbon. I think we should be looking at a much wider suite of indicators around sustainable development. And the key question is how we integrating or embedding and integrating it into policies across all government departments. But my, my question is around what I think is also uh, a missed opportunity, first in the beginning session and here today now, which is we haven't really addressed the issue of how we are going to um, provide our cities the resilience to cope with future climate change. There is a tremendous opportunity to provide jobs in this area. And so my question is, as a green government and in opposition, do we believe we're doing enough to prepare our populations and our cities to be resilient against future climate change? Okay, and I can take one more question, I think, in that group. Has anyone who's been waiting for a long time, anyone want to volunteer for that's the final point? Yep, um, gentleman at the back there. Uh, Don Naylor, uh, Stockport Unison. Um, Luciana touched on this point, uh, the fact that it, it's very easy and it's, it's currently the case that uh, climate change has fallen off the, uh, the, the, the media's uh, radar. Um, I think we need to be more proactive than saying that's awful. We need to get it back on there. I mean, I, th I think because of a lack of media coverage, there is only encouraging passive or active climate change denial and we really can't allow that to, to continue for any, any further time at all. So my question is, we need to turn it around and how, how do we get this, this very real issue back on the agenda that's, that's going to affect our communities, particularly coastal ones? Okay, thank you very much. Good question to end on. I'll come to Luciana first, um, just to answer any of those key points there and to make any final points you want to do before we close this session. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, on, the, on the point about the media, I wasn't suggesting that we don't do anything about it. Um, it, is a, it is a massive issue. It's a massive challenge. I'm faced with it every day. The number of discussions I have with journalists, the number of you know, press releases we put together, the number of reports we put together. And there was one day where we had a, you know, a really important story um, that needed to be shared. And the response that we got from newspapers right across the board and, and broadcast media was, well, we've got our environment story for the day. It's about the third runway. And, and you know that's 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 the challenge that we're facing with editors. We get a lot of stuff online, um, it's fair to say, but it doesn't often um, get into the into the print. And so we just have to work harder. Um, we are trying, um, and we're doing our own thing within within the Labour Party itself. To as the Shadow Energy and Climate Change team, we're trying to get out across the country and meet the people and to kind of raise these issues. We've got our own website, and if you've got any ideas about how else you think we can get our message out, you know, please, please share them with us because we are absolutely committed to doing everything we can to raise the profile of it. We're not helped by the fact that there was a, a YouGov poll that showed that back in 2009, just over 20% of the British public thought that climate change was in their top three issues that, that they were concerned about. That figure dropped to 4% last year, at the end of last year. So we've got a challenge with you know, what the public thinks and, and how, how they prioritise this issue. But I do think it's, you know, to make the party political point, and I think it's worth, it is worth making, it's about leadership. And you can say, you know, what parliaments did, but actually, if you don't have a prime minister and a chancellor really leading this agenda, then we, we have challenge. We have a challenge on our hands. Um, the, the gentleman's point about providing cities with resilience on climate change. There is lots of work going on, I think, in some country. In, sorry, forgive me. In, in some cities across the country, I know locally in Liverpool, with making our bid to be the greenest city uh, ever, the, the European greenest city. And we're looking at the kind of the smart city agenda, but it's fair to say again that not all cities are doing this. And, they, and I think it is down to government to kind of really lead the way centrally to make sure that it's not just pockets of activity, but we're, we're protecting communities up and down, down the country. 
And forgive me, I didn't get the lady's name, um, the first question. Um, I think I've kind of shared that we're trying to ensure that this agenda, uh, everything around the low carbon uh, economy, low carbon growth is a central pillar of everything that we're doing. It's not an add-on, it's central to the conversations we're having right across our shadow teams and beyond. We're trying to take it out to the country. Um, Ed Miliband's about to do a, a national tour across the country and this will be a central theme that he will be raising and addressing as he did at our party conference. And you know, I, I share your concern about many of the things that, uh, many of the terrible things that have been done. I was on the march as well on Saturday and we just have to fight harder, shout louder and make sure that we've got the policies in place so that when we are re-elected that we can actually make the changes that our country deserves. Thanks very much. And, and Lord Lieben, any final points? Well, uh, first of all, uh, that last question about uh, changing the agenda is absolutely crucial. Uh, I noted that Luciana said we get uh, quite good references on the blogs and, and on the internet. I mean, I think that's where we have to start. I think everybody here should say to themselves, I will make sure that I take part in one or other of the blogs and anything you're interested in it's important to do it. If you do the gardening blogs, it's still important to be able to put the bit in about the climate change. We've got to make every part of our lives um, areas where people recognize the connection between what they do, what they care about, what they're interested in, whether it's the Catholic blogs or the gardening blogs, that they actually take this seriously. Now, I watch them. Uh, we have a little group of us which uh, take on different sets of blogs and uh, I said take on a particular set of blogs and I've just seen how the climate deniers are there all the time. They're dropping in odd comments all the time. Now we've got to be better than they are at doing it and it's partly our, I mean it's a real issue. It's rather like the whole problem of the European Union. We've allowed the opponents to get away with murder over the years, and as a result, we've got a generally Eurosceptic nation, which is entirely damaging. So we need, we need not to let that happen to us here. We've actually got to fight this battle in order to make sure that we don't have a climate-sceptic nation, because we haven't fought in every single occasion. So I think we do have it in our hands. And the thing about the newspapers, of course, the newspapers... Uh, do react to the uh, amount of stuff that goes through the blogs. I sometimes think the journalists only get their news from the blog. So we need, we need to make sure that if they constantly hear it, they're constantly pressed, it begins to make them realise that this, that this is an issue that they have to take up. And, and I agree with Luciana that there's a real concern that even those newspapers uh, which have been good on this, the Guardian is a good example, and, and indeed the Financial Times has been very good on these, these issues, and, and, and the Economist, but they need to feel that these are things that people want to read about. So the blogs are crucial to that, I think. Now, the, the, the point that uh, was raised about the sustainability, I mean, I wholly agree with that. I, I have a problem because of what I call mission creep, and I, people always want you to comment on everything, and I'm determined not to get oneself into that position. But the truth is that there is only one future for the world, and that is a sustainable future. There is no alternative, just as there's no growth without, except green growth, because the future is in our hands. We have this horrifying fact that we know that we can destroy the, the, the planet. And therefore, we have to recognize sustainability in every aspect. And I think you're perfectly right to make sure that we don't see the battle against climate change as a, a thing on its own. That's why I always say to people, you don't need to believe in climate change. You just need to know that there'll be 9 billion people on this earth. And therefore, all those things that we have to do have to be done because of that. So the, these things are coming together. Now, I'm sure that... the first of the three questioners will not mind me saying this. I'm sure that we can all have different views about the issues that she raises. But the biggest issue of all is whether our grandchildren will be able to live on this earth. That's the biggest issue of all. And all I don't want is the issue of climate change to be submerged by things that other people feel strongly about. Because there is no other issue which is as important. And if I may say to her, she's not encouraging me to be inclusive. And even though she and I would disagree on a whole range of those things, no doubt, 
If she wants a future for her children and her grandchildren, then she's got to get everybody on board she can get on board. And it isn't the right way about it somehow to say that there's only one mechanism for doing it. We'll all have our favoured ones. We'll all know that this group or that group are more likely to deliver. But in the end, none of us will deliver unless we deliver it together, which is why I'm not going to make a party political comment. Well, um, well thank you. Um, thank you very much to, um, to our panel. I mean, the, um, I think as Frances reflected on in her speech, the TUC's work on the future of our economy and the huge challenges facing our economy in the years ahead very much focuses on addressing the problems of falling household living standards, lack of job creation for young people and sustainable and green growth as a cohesive and holistic part of the fairer and new economy that we need to build in the future. So I would just like to extend again great thanks to, um, to the panellists who are